Well, it's good to have you here. Thank yeah. you. We have a couple new commissioners. Yeah. And maybe we could do some introductions. So That'd be great. You guys come back and forth. I've met both of you. Okay. I'm Jessica Gomez. Really, you know, there's a lot of that kind of going on in the 
spaces, um, thinking that we can sort of replicate that here. And it turns out that um, uh, that specific model isn't really right for, for an area like, um, like us. We're a little bit more rural. Our entrepreneurs are really um, diverse. We have a lot of different types of companies, kind of one of each, really. Um, you know, so we have, um, we have a, a lot of um, tech companies, but they're, you know, one agriculture tech, one, you know, semiconductor like us, one, soft, you know, two or three software, we have a handful of e-commerce, so it's really spread out, and then from that, you know, you get your sort of startup companies coming out of that, and, and they're also very diverse, so um, we came up with about, a, we tried the other model for six, eight months, and it just didn't really take it. So we sort of revamped the entire sort of thinking about how we do this here, how we really implement um, this type of economic development um, in our rural regions. Um, and so that's when we came up with, um, you know, the sort of business accelerator, the more intensive sort of 12 week, um, you know, process where you can do things more virtual, where someone doesn't have to come all the way out from Sands Valley or um, you know, Williams or Common Falls to, to uh, say in the programs. And we also made it very customized because if you look at this, this page, you look at these pictures and the logos, <coughs> these are our graduates from this last cohort. And you've got an app developer on the upper left. You have a, a fermented honey soda bottling company here in the, in the valley, which is still pre automation equipment, still hand bottling says no on a, on a weekly basis to probably 13 deals because he's you know needs fundraising to get that equipment to do the automated bottling so there's we really look for companies that um, just need the mentoring and some seed money and and then they'll be they'll be on the next target for for increased revenue really quickly uh, then we have a you know a lot of the farmers markets actually I'll just say are actually a really interesting um, incubator in, in and of themselves for these types of value-added food producers so a lot of We've gotten some really interesting companies come through there, like Terrasol Organics, and um, and then we've got an electric vehicle company making small automated um, vehicles for small and specialty ag. Um, Grovolution out of Klamath Falls are students from Oregon Tech, and they're developing a should they use recycled shipping containers, and then they retrofit them with aeroponic units, and then they can grow up to a 640 acre farm, or one acre footprint, um, stacking four high. So those kinds of real no, how many acres? One. No, 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 no. 640, 640 is their wow. estimate. They're still prototyping, so, uh, and they're 98% water efficient, so once you put water in the system, they're only 2% loss. And so, but they're, they're still, you know, in prototyping phase, and so that's where we feel the greatest need is, really, with these, these early stage advanced manufacturing companies, is to come in, get them the mentoring, a little bit of seed money, get them to where they can speak to investors properly, and they can bring some more wealth in here to commercialize their mm -hmm. products. Um, then our other really interesting innovation, and I, Jessica is really the, the mastermind of this, is the iGram. We're two years into this, and this is our, we don't, our focus isn't on, you know, recruitment necessarily, uh, but we also don't have a research institute here that's going to take really big game-changing technologies and commercialize them. We don't have, you know, our, our entrepreneurs don't have access to labs and foundries and the kinds of things that you would at you know, OSU or at Stanford, you know, you can commercialize because you have access to that. So Jessica said, well, I have a little bit of extra capacity. Um, she put up $150,000 of in-kind services and use of the engineers and folks at the foundry. And uh, our second our second go at this uh, was awarded to a company called Indi Indiana Integrated Circuits. It was chosen in partnership with MEMS Industry Group, which is a global company that does MEMS conferences all around the world. And they made our job a little bit easier. They, they got all the professionals and they chose the winner. And so we're just working with them here in Southern Oregon to commercialize their technologies, which is a, a real kind of an interesting, very B2B kind of not very commercial, you know, retail applica applicable thing, but it's a very cool technology. Um, yeah, you know, we're gonna, we're still in the, I think, the process of really um, figuring out um, the IGRI process. You know, I think that this new, um, this year, um, sort of partnering with Men's Industry Group was really good. Um, it was good for Southern Oregon, it was great for Sustainable Valley. 
um, and really good for those startup companies because it really it gets all of us sort of out there on a more of a worldwide stage to say, hey, you know, there's really cool things going on in Southern Oregon. Um, and I think we had something like 200, 280 people at that conference, maybe more than that, um, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, Heather got up and gave a presentation on Sustainable Valley um, and was the moderator of um, the um, sort of pitch um, competition that the companies went through. Um, there was a vetting process, and so that was really positive. And they came and they were visited. They visited with us, um, and they began all over talking about the Iowa, talking about you know the Valley, um, talking about Southern Oregon. So um, you know we'll see um, how that relationship evolves over the next you know this coming year. Um, it's a year long um, process, um, and. Um, you know, we're doing things like, you know, going to do some joint press releases. We're going to license their technology. We're going to connect them up with um, our set of customers that we think could utilize this new technology. So it's more than just the fabrication. It's sort of a, a business sort of partnership um, type arrangement. Um, and I, I think it's pretty cool, and I'm really excited to see um, how that evolves over time. And, um, you know, we're, we're sort of considering some themes, you know, for next year. So we're going to do it year over year. So we did last year. Um, this year, was uh, this company ends up on more of the packaging technology side for um, micro devices. Um, and we're thinking, you know, let's take a look at sort of a medical application or, you know, bio um, type application potentially for this coming year. So um, we're going to be partnering with MIG again, Men's Industry Group, and kind of doing that same um, set up and see how I think this year the conference is in Napa. Um, so that's really exciting. The, the, the first year of the I grant, I don't remember the name. I think she was there last year. Um, some okay. check. Yeah. And you made the award, and I think it was a device that detected cancer, or yes. cancer, mm -hmm. uh, without intruding, right? It was like, yeah. Uh, and so what, what happened? So what happened with um, that particular technology, it was licensed out of uh, the University of New Mexico uh, by a company um, in, I think it was Mass, uh, um, so East Coast company. Um, they were um, sort of similar um, foundry um, type of company, and um, this was sort of a side project for them that they were planning to um, turned over to a, a new company itself. So they were sort of in the process of developing and, and sort of starting up this new company. Before they could do that, the other company sort of imploded, which happens a lot in tech. Um, so um, they shut down the, the larger company, which which um, um, didn't, um, they didn't have sort of the, uh, how do you say, the resources to go through with the SBIR grant, which was the part two of what we, we um, provided them. Um, and so they decided to kind of take a step back and reinvent sort of this new company and start to start over. Um, and they're still in the process of doing that. They weren't able to sort of take advantage of what we had to offer, what we had to offer from a manufacturing standpoint because they just weren't there with the corporate structure um, yet. So they're kind of still in you know, fundraising mode. Um, and they have an extension on their license through New Mexico. And we're waiting to see what happens with that. Um, so it was actually, you know, if you think about kind of all in all, it didn't really accomplish what we thought it would. But, you know, great press. Um, you know, we got um, a lot of um, people excited about this type of, you know, grant structure. Um, we have a really good relationship with the initial um, engineer um, that came to us, Dana. Um, and she's working with an IT firm right now, um, doing really innovative types of investments. Um, so we're going to look at potentially, you know, what work we can do with her later. Um, so there was a lot of really positive things that came out of it, out of that, without actually any um, sort of big major investments um, on our part. So um, you know, we figured let's see what happens with this, and we'll just keep doing this until we figure out what the right mix of ingredients are to really um, have this kick off. And then once we're able to do that, um, thought process is that we can transfer this type of grant structure into other industries, software, um, other types of manufacturing. So let me, let me just, for, and I actually think you're right, I wasn't here either. 
Yeah. But just so you know, the county actually seed funded this program to start fifty thousand dollars for the first two years. It was essentially funded mostly by the county, mm -hmm. um, and as they spun off and created a nonprofit, they actually looked at creating for-profit subsidiaries under the nonprofit, kind of like Pacific Retirement Services does. Um, and just to explain kind of the transition that they got, but I do want to point out a couple of other things that, that and you heard this, but I don't know if you've heard it. it just could put $150,000 of her own company's money, essentially, into the I grant program. And she's served uh, this group of Heather, uh, came on as many people to know they served over, uh, in the last couple of years, 28 uh, entrepreneurs and 40 companies that they interact with. So it is. Um, creating results. It's taken longer than was first proposed. We, we expected to see those kinds of numbers after the first three to five years, or six, I think, or five. Five, I think, yeah. So we're at the end of it, creating the numbers, but it is creating some positive outcomes now. I do agree with Justice Conn that, you know, I didn't, I didn't know the outcome of the first year. It wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest. We, we tried really hard, and it, you know, it's it's uh, economic development is one of those really elusive things. I actually didn't, um, you know, going into this process, I was really excited, and you know, from a business perspective, you think you have a product, you make money, you know, that seems like a reasonable expectation, right? But when you when you sort of start to develop these programs, it's it's really a, a really elusive process on how to be effective, how to get the results that you need, and also sort of how to figure out uh, ways to sustain um, that process um, because it takes a long time. Um, you know, if you think about sort of in general economic development strategies, I mean, this is you know a twenty-year process before we really got you know these companies are thriving, healthy, you know are, are you know building buildings or you know 50, 100 people here, right? But we have to start somewhere. You know, we have to start when there are two and three people because the recruitment um, strategy doesn't always work, and it actually, in some ways, um, from what I've done in my research, you know, it, it costs a lot of money also. There's a lot of investment involved with that process, and then you end up sort of with a company that's maybe um, not as connected as you would like. Um, so also, there's chasing that extra incentive or, you know, things like that. So diversity is really important um, for this type of economy, I think, um, you know, and sort of that, that concept of really encouraging that new growth all the time, you know, just, you know, having that process just over and over and over, you know, happening, new companies starting up, um, and then, you know, you get these two, three, four that will kind of pop out and start really, you um, sort of The intangibles also of culture change is, is something that you can't really put in a annual report, right? But we have an impact venture fund started now in Ashland to move down here on purpose because the work, honestly, like some of the work that we've done and that we have an angel conference, like there's some markers that make for an innovative environment. And if the goal is to keep our young people here, keep them here with opportunities, grow a thriving downtown Medford as a hub, an economic hub for this region, you, know, you need your young people engaged and your young people are the best positions to start their own businesses and grow their own businesses for the most part. So, uh, you know, we've I've, got, I've fielded calls over the last year from all over the state, all the way as far as Baker City, La Grande, Pendleton, Coos Bay, everyone in Klamath Falls, everybody is trying to figure this out. How do we grow our own? And many of them are making some of the same mistakes, I think, that, that were made in the beginning. And it's just a learning process, but um, copying models that work in urban areas isn't, isn't going to work. So we had to be, you know, innovative and, and, and iterate. But now we can teach some of these other more local features how how this works, and grow the capital pipeline, which is another sort of focus that we're working on now. So I think it's been an inspiration. You know, I think the brand is good. I think it's got really a lot of um, people inspired that they could also do this in, in their area. Like Klamath Idea, um, we're talking to them a lot about how they can make this happen, just you know, sort of on a shoestring budget, so to speak. How can you maximize returns for your And if you're, if some of the metrics, you know, we also, if you go to the next page, do a lot of work with STEM. We were integral into creating the Southern Oregon STEM Hub with um, 
so the Oregon ESD, Rogue Workforce Partnership, College Games, Dream Achievement, and we actually have a, a business accelerator that we're piloting. Uh, Ashland High School is, is three semesters or three quarters into working with students right in the classroom with the business accelerator, and we want to have scholarships and have like a little mini angel conference for high school students, so we have five, five schools all around, so that will happen in May. So it's just building the pipeline ahead of, ahead of when you want it. Um, our annual event, we switched gears. We used to do a venture forum, and it was a, it was a they were, we did it for two years. They were great events. We had the you know, Bay Area and Seattle venture firms come and, and talk about venture investing in, in more of a traditional way, and I think um, we, we wanted to focus a lot more on the, the tech culture the, and, and get something a little bit younger and funner that was really engaging to the community and not just a small segment of the community. So we, our, our event was called Techtoberfest. We did it, um, it's a kickoff to Oktoberfest and um, we did it in Jacksonville this year. I think we'll do it in downtown Memphis this coming year. And we have a futures forum, so visiting speakers from all over talking about you know, futures of different technologies. And then it's also the graduation event for our companies that go through the accelerator. So that they we have that sort of entrepreneur showcase and they get to get up and give their pitches to the community and talk about what they're doing. And then our metrics, I don't know how we are on time if we're taking up too much, but um, uh, last page is, is the metrics. So after talking with our companies, keeping track of what's, what's been going on on, on that front, um, we arrived at a $1.6 million follow-on funding uh, since our inception working with the companies, which is maybe lower than, than we thought, but also sort of surprising and, um, and actually quite a bit more exciting than we thought. And there's also now a lot of attention and things coming from the state to perhaps get a, a seed fund started here in Southern Oregon. Uh, there's a Portland seed fund, and that's that's about it as far as the state goes. Um, attaching it to the accelerator, working with our investors, bringing our accredited, our, our wealthier individuals out of the work will really help put their money to work as well. So we're really focused on making this number bigger and growing that capital pipeline because it's really always about mentoring, it's about money. Can you talk a little, a little bit about the uh, crowdfunding? Oh, yeah, we actually helped write some administrative rules. That was a fun experience. Uh, we were going to go through legislature. We were working with um, <laughs> Tobias Reed's office in Beaverton. He was going to put, put the bill forward. And, um, we were not first movers on this as a state, which was really good. There was 13 states who had already passed their own version of an interstate crowdfunding bill. And we got to look at all the things that they did, and take what we liked and what we didn't like. And it was really sparked off of the, the lag with the Jobs Act. People were tired of waiting. So states just said, well, if money doesn't pass over state lines, there's already an exemption in SEC regulations that says you can do what you want. So all we did was help the state of Oregon define what it is that we want to do. So uh, companies can raise up to $250,000 from everyday Oregonians, no matter how much money they make, which is huge. And uh, and the, each individual investor can invest up to $2,500 per company. Most of the shares are $100, $250, something like that. So in the first three weeks, and this is sort of the impressive number, the first three weeks, we had nine companies come out of the gate from all over. Southern Oregon has the highest density of companies using this law, actually, probably you know, because we helped write it, and we have companies ready to go because of the accelerator. So anyway, four of the nine are, are Southern Oregon companies. And in three weeks, um, they earned $100,000 around the state, which seems like maybe a small number, but in three weeks, at $100, $250 increments, that's hundreds of first movers in the state of Oregon that put their money to work for startups. So this is a really exciting opportunity. And just for some perspective, you know, we focus a lot on angel investing as, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. They're your accredited investors. They can do what they want. Um, but in 2013, there was only a uh, billion dollars invested nationally, $1.1 billion of angel money. And we, as a region, including Washington, only bring home about 5% of that. Uh, in the, so it's, it's not a, a huge amount of money, um, investment speaking, but 1% of the money that Oregonians have in savings just in Oregon is about a billion dollars. So if you could get the 99% of investors that have never been able to invest before to part with some of their, with 1% of their money, all of a sudden you liberated about a billion dollars into the state of Oregon for entrepreneurs. It's a really huge number. 
So it's a, it's like it's a baby. We talk about it like a baby, you know. It doesn't even have diapers. You have to kind of like you know walk around and help get its clothes on and make sure that it doesn't you know get sort of nothing bad happens to it. It, it doesn't eat the wrong things and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's nine companies. It's new. These are securities. These are invest. These are real investments, just like you would on stock market, only for Oregon. So. You know, these companies can talk about what they're doing for the first time. You've never been able to do that before either. Those pitches, that, you, that those public pitches and things, those were never really fully in compliance with SEC law. So this allows companies to be able to put a sticker on their product, they can put things on their website. They can talk about the fact that they're doing fundraising. And so when farmers markets start here in a couple of weeks, we've got a couple of companies that are really excited because the first one to meet their minimum was a company in, called Red Wagon Creamery in Eugene. And I think the reason why is because they have a store and they were able to just talk to people every day. Here's, you want to buy an ice cream? You want to share too? You know, here's a hundred dollars. You want to buy a security? And so they made their, they reached their minimum in, in uh, less than a month. So when the company grows and becomes a sector and activities across state lines, what does that do to those uh, home investors? So this is where the mentoring and coaching really comes in and is helpful. So if they want follow, if they want follow-on funding, uh, a lot of accredited investors or venture firms don't really like having like a thousand investors. So they put stuff in, into their term sheets that say, at any time we're going to consolidate and buy, and buy these shares. Out. So it's kind of as long as they're, they're smart about how they approach it, then it's, it's fine. Their revenue does have to be, they're actually their assets, 80% of their assets as a company have to be in Oregon. So they can do business really anywhere, but as, as long as 80% of their assets are in Oregon. So, you know, companies can't just come in and, you know, have one little division and, it, and they also have to meet with someone in person. There's a few, there's a few um, safeguards that we built in on purpose to make sure that we limited the fraud. Okay. Real quick to one of the metrics you have here, the 98 jobs created or retained. Mm -hmm. um, how do you determine if it's one that was created or retained by your efforts? Um, you know, what's the nexus? I know that's a tough thing to answer. It's not always direct. Uh, the other is, do you have any sort of um, information on like what the average salary range of these 98? I, mean, I know maybe you don't have this information right now, but um, I'm kind of curious. And if you've applied any sort of multiplier to that to see what kind of real impact it's had. As far as uh, the economy of the valley um, and its economic impact as related to uh, your efforts? Yeah, jobs are tricky. They're not really a great metric for us because we work with really early stage companies. Um, these are, that's why we put the retained after, which you know we can't take total credit for. We don't know. I mean, would they be in business without us? It's a hard thing to, to, to tell if it was because of the accelerator or not, uh, because of the support they get. But um, that's that's how many people, the average salary is uh, 14, I think I didn't, I forgot to put that on here. Uh, it's like $15 an hour-ish. So it's a little lower than what we're looking for. We'd really like to get those tech companies, the ones um, you know, that, that have the ability to hire mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and programmers, and those kinds of people who make a really great wage. But for now, um, they're not there yet. They're not ready. They're still prototyping. They're still not Certainly not hire, discounting so. those jobs either. I mean, it's very valuable as well. Uh, but I was just curious. Yeah, I'd love to do a little more deep dive into the actual impact when, you know, over the five years. And I think when you get to the, um, the state economists, are also really interested because there hasn't been a whole lot of stories to tell around the state of any one of these actually working before and surviving. And so we were very well funded in the beginning to do what we did. We took some turns. We stayed really lean. We didn't hire much people. Like kind of did everything uh, with the board and pulled on all of our amazing volunteers. This, this community is just. I, I just can't say enough. I mean, they're putting, putting their intellect, their talents, we have a lot of Bay Area retirees, we have a lot of really brilliant mentors, coaches, investors. You know, the Southern Oregon Angel Conference has got something like 120 accredited investors that they've identified, and I, we've found our own throughout the woodwork. So, you know, it's um, starting to get to a, a critical mass point where they're starting to participate a lot. And, you know, we were sort of the driver on this, but by no means did this happen in a vacuum. This is the work of a lot of really talented and 
prevention of people. I mean, really, we've had so much sort of community support. Um, and, you know, I would say in the last um, you know, year, um, we were starting to um, sort of do a lot more collaborative um, work. Um, you know, since we're co located with so many investment um, board, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of ideas that are still getting flushed out on how we can really integrate, you know, all three of these things that are going on to sort of um, uh, magnify the effects. You know, how can we utilize our resources better to get better results for, for companies that own commercial development? And so, um, you know, we proposed a, we have a proposal on the legal solutions um, that, uh, you know, it's called the Road Advantage. Um, So you have workforce development, traditional economic development, which is about attracting and retaining, and then grow your own business incubation acceleration is really starting to become the third thing to even those things out. Um, if you're not growing your own, you're constantly pulling from the outside, um, you're not creating a whole lot of really grassroots resilience of, of <coughs> culture change and you know all that stuff that makes uh, money move around your community. So, you know, we're going to be heading into um, our, I think this is our sort of last year of, you know, really reliable um, funding. Um, and so we're going to be looking for, looking to raise money in the next few months. Um, you know, uh, we've got some options that are um, coming up um, and we may um, come back to the person matching funds to those. Um, so just kind of want to be aware of that. Um, and just in general, we're really excited about it's been a great experience and really eye-opening. <laughs> I just have to say that for all of you that do this as a as a regular job, I, I'm just <laughs> I'm in awe because it's really tough work. <laughs> it really is. Well, I just uh, you said as far as our community, you were really helping to add value added food production. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? So uh, your farmers grow things. And so your value-added food producers hopefully would take the things grown at the farms and then turn them into products that can be packaged and distributed outside the farm. Okay. So that could be sodas. Yeah, like the growers markets has a lot of those types of companies. Um, you know, the one, the stuff that would get on a, on a truck that isn't fresh, perishable produce, right? Stuff that has a longer shelf life that can be distributed farther. Um, it's sort of that, in that sort of organic gourmet Sort of artisan farms and food yeah. type market where you know you're taking something that's locally grown potentially and um, you know, making this um, really delicious you know sort of good for you type of uh, food and and um, you know getting it into let's say Whole Foods you know, or Trader Joe's um, and places like that. And so how do you assist that in kind of business? So they're actually very similar uh, when you're mentoring them. They're very similar to a, a high-tech or advanced manufacturing company. They have infrastructure needs, they have equipment needs, they take longer to commercialize, they have distribution, they're making tangible goods that are more expensive, their margins are smaller than software and things like that. You, you know, they're more of, more of a sustainable company. It's going to take them longer to be a buyout purchase. 
uh, and you know their um, their impact I would say is greater because they buy locally mostly especially when they're small they buy from local farmers and producers they use local accountants they use you know there's this whole ripple effect of, of these types of companies where a software company they could hire programmers from anywhere their customers could be anywhere you know they're not really creating anything tangible that's gonna, that's going to actually add value to the community and even in, if you think about the equipment set that they would bring on, right? I mean, those get resold maybe, even if they go out of business, then you have more assets in the community. So we focused our efforts mostly on those types of things. Yeah, and not to, you know, not to sort of discount the impact that software developers have, because I mean, it's a really big deal. I mean, we need that. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, you, can, you can do that from anywhere, and that's why it's been so attractive, I think, for, for rural areas, but I think we need a more, a really much more diverse economy than just that. Uh, and so, you know, there's, um, there's certain things that you can, sort of little knobs that you can kind of tweak to create the right environment, and that's really what we're working on with, with this, to sort of, um, you know, make sure that it's not just software, it's not just e-commerce, but it's, you know, creating sort of a, um, Sort of diversified, um, wealth generating, um, you know, um, group of companies that are sort of continue to generate new and innovative ideas and new companies kind of branching off of that. So um, it takes a long time. Um, it's, and it's definitely a process. I want to thank both of you for taking the time and yeah. sort of explaining everything to us today and where you're at and where you're going. And is there any questions? And if you do have an ask for us in the future, I, I should prepare it the right people and then we can discuss that with people. Thank you. See that way it goes. Uh, congratulations on the work. It's nice to see the numbers coming up. You know what it is on the back side of it. <laughs> it is a, an opportunity for a new entrepreneurs in Wood Valley to be able to find ways to go to business and kind of see this uh, very difficult environment. So. And just to let you know, for uh, compact purposes, while it's always good to bring something to work. The commissioner of Dyer is a liaison for development. They have come from the advisory committee and so they have some data contact. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.